everybody, welcome to Mysteries and Histories. I'm Michelle Bennington, and today I wanted to do a book review of a historical fiction that I really liked. It's The Oracle Glass by Judith Merkel Riley. It's kind of a behemoth of a book. <laughs> it's 52 chapters and about 528 pages. It is historical fiction, but it's not quite genre fiction. It's not quite literary fiction. It's kind of this hybrid between genre and literary, or commercial, I should say, rather than genre. Um, it's kind of this hybrid between commercial and literary, what's known as upmarket fiction. And I've got my notes here. I'm going to tell you all about this book. I have to have notes or I'm going to forget things, <laughs> because that's the way my brain goes. Uh, if I had to write this, or if I had to rate this book on the, like a movie, on the scale of mature audiences only down to G, I would probably say this is about a PG-14. And the 14-year-old should probably be very mature. <laughs> In fact, I probably would let my 16-year-old read it if I had a 16-year-old. Um, because there is, you know, the book has a lot of murder in it and torture. Um, it has a incestuous rape scene and it and it talks a great deal about abortion and so um, it's got some rough content in it but it's also very accurate to what 17th century France was too uh, it was a very rough time but the fun thing about this book because it is a historical novel it is based on real life events it is based on the what's known as the Affair of the Poisons that happened back in Paris in um, 17th century France during the reign of Louis XIV. But because this is historical fiction, we do have real life characters like La Voisin, who was a real life uh, sorceress or witch, I guess for lack of a better word back uh, during that time and she was responsible for a lot of the poisons that were sold uh, during the affair of the poisons. So there are many real life characters in here to establish that historical period and that historical frame. But then there are also a lot of fictional characters and in fact the main characters and the, the protagonist and the love interest are uh, fictional. So what Riley did is she created this 15-year-old girl, Genevieve Pasquier, and dropped her down into 17th century Paris, France, and uh, spun a little web of a story around her, and we end up with the oracle glass. If I had to rate this book on a scale of one to five, five being the best, I loved it, loved it, loved it, one being I hated it, didn't even finish it, <laughs> I would rate it about a 3.5. And there were some weird, quirky things in there that I wasn't quite happy with. One thing is that I didn't really buy into the love interest. It, it just, it didn't seem cohesive to me. It didn't seem real and genuine to me. So I had a problem with the relationship this is why romance writers are important. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I'm just being silly. You have to put up with that if you're going to watch me. So that was one thing, was the love interest. I didn't feel like it was real and authentic. The other thing that I didn't like is I felt the story ended very quickly. Here we are. We're in this 528-page 520 book. Go ahead and make it a little bit longer so that we can have a sufficient ending that feels like true closure. So it just kind of felt like the publisher was saying, hey, Judith, we need your book. Hurry up and finish it. We got to get her done. And she said, okay, um, la, 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 the end. <laughs> I don't want to spoil anything. <clears throat> so I didn't really like the way it ended. The other thing I didn't like, and this is kind of a big beef, because it's kind of like the whole story. So here's the problem. This 15-year-old girl is supposed to pass as an ancient fortune teller. Like they put her, 
and I'll explain it. I'll go into a little more detail about what the book is about here in just a second so this one this will make sense but she's supposed to essentially be passing for someone almost a hundred years older than what she really is just with a little bit of makeup and some costuming um no <laughs> no 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 I know that I don't think spectacles were invented yet back then. They could have been, um, whether they were or not. Even the poorest of candlelight, I don't care how bad your vision is, even the poorest bit of candlelight is not going to make that pass. You cannot convince me that this 15-year-old girl in the first fresh bloom of her youth is going to pass as an ancient crone. I don't care what amount of makeup you put on her, it's not gonna happen. Anybody with more than two brain cells to rub together is going to be able to see right through that. Even today with our modern makeup advances, you can't, I mean, it's almost, you can't pass that off. Not with just regular standard makeup. I mean, now the people in Hollywood with the prosthetics and all of that, I mean, they can because they have all this latex and stuff that they can work with to, make those wrinkles and all of that, but just regular makeup? No, no. No, no, no. And, you know, she's sitting at a table right next to people. So if you're this close, you're going to be able to see, like you can see all my wrinkles. <laughs> so if you're very close, you're going to be able to see that this is a kid. You know? And you're going to be able to tell that she's putting on a voice. I mean, I'm a more, I'm an older woman, so you can tell that I don't have the voice of a 15-year-old. You can tell that because as you age, your voice drops. And if you're 15 years old, you would have to make yourself sound like this. And, you know, that's, it's stupid. So that premise, I really wish that um, Riley would have come up with a little something more believable because that kind of really irritated me having said that the reason I now if her writing style had been crap I would have voted it much lower because of that storyline but because her writing style was so lush and beautiful it transported me right back to the 17th century France and the description, you could tell that this book was deeply, deeply researched. I mean, just the details of the, you know, the cobblestones and the horse dung in the streets and the mud in the streets and, uh, and the discomfort of the nobility and all of that and the lushness of Versailles and the Hall of Mirrors. And it was just... I mean, because, you know, it was, it was kind of nasty back in Paris, France in those days. You would, if people had to urinate, they would just stop wherever they were and just do it. <laughs> they would just urinate in the streets. So you really got this over, you know, you got this sense of how dirty and filthy Paris really was back then. I didn't know anything about standing in a puddle of urine might be a health hazard. In fact, in the Hall of Mirrors, here's a little bit of fun fact, history fun fact for you. <clears throat> in the Hall of Mirrors, the nobility would line up for hours and hours and hours. They would spend all day just waiting to see the king. And of course, you know, you can only hold, Mother Nature will only hold off for so long. Well, they didn't have porta potties go and discreetly stand by a corner or by a potted plant or a curtain or whatever and just urinate. So you can only imagine how bad it smelled in that palace. It's, I mean, it would have smelled like all kinds of urine. Ew. But that, that was life in 17th century Paris, France. But she, she did such a wonderful job of pulling in all those little details, but she did it in such a way that it wasn't clunky because that's kind of something that you can run into when you try to write historical fiction is you do all this background research and you're so eager to get it all in there that it comes off kind of clunky like, 
oh, here's all this history. And you just get big history dumps right in the middle of the page. And that really pulls you out of the story when you run across those things. But she wove it in so intricately and so beautifully. And the story in that respect, it just really came alive. And so that's why I really wish she had come up with a different, um, a different life style for this kid that we're going to be talking about because that would have just that would have sent the book way into the five star range for me. I mean, I loved her writing so much that I actually went and bought all of her other books, and I'm really looking forward to reading them. But they're they're currently in my to be read pile, TBR. And it could be another two or three years before I get to those books, unless I need to bump them up to the top for some reason. But so a little bit about the story itself. It's about Jean-Vier Pasquier, 15 year old girl who's been transformed into a 150 year old fortune teller. So that's another thing. 150 years old, come on. And this kid, she's very bright and bookish and intelligent and really close to her grandmother and her father, but her mother is basically a domineering and ambitious shrew um, who is always striving for great wealth and power and will stop at nothing to get it. And I'm thinking that Riley probably modeled the mother a little bit on Madame de Bronvier. At least that's my gut instinct. Um, and Madame de Bronvier is the person who kind of ignited the whole um, affair of the poisons, the real life event. Her and her lover decided that they were going to be together and they wanted a lot of money and a lot of wealth, but they started killing people off in order to collect that money. And um, I'm not gonna tell you too much about Madame de Bronvier because I really do wanna do another video on her. Uh, she's a fascinating character, and uh, she is someone that I am currently writing a book about. So I don't want to talk too much about her in this video, but I think the mother is, is modeled on Madame de Bronvier. And so the mother becomes involved in this, now we're back in the fiction. <laughs> the mother becomes involved in poisoning people uh, for money. And she starts to go to a local witch who reads fortunes, and that's how she gets involved in poisoning people for money. I don't want to give too much away because, you know, spoiler alert. There are two sisters. Jean Vieve is not the beautiful one. Jean Vieve has a limp. She has like a malformed, um, I guess it's like a club foot. She has a malformed leg or something. And so she walks with a limp and she's not very beautiful, but her sister is, is beautiful. The beautiful sister ends up becoming the mistress of a very powerful aristocrat, thanks to the mother and the witch's spell. The mother is, you know, really eager to get that beautiful daughter in, in cahoots with the aristocracy so that maybe she can meet the king and probably eventually become the king's mistress. That's the mother's goal. Because if you were the king's mistress, you didn't have to worry about anything except another mistress coming along to steal your place. <laughs> Other than that, you were set for life. The mal malformed sister, Jean Vier, um, feels just unwelcome and unloved and like she doesn't belong. And so she runs away from home after she is assaulted by her uncle. She's taken in to this coven of witches, which is led by La Voisin. La Voisin was a real person. She really did exist. She really did create poisons and herbs and potions and spells, and she really did sell them to people so that they could kill inconvenient husbands and, you know, wives that were no longer wanted. So, <laughs> um, she really did exist. The other witches in the coven, I did not go so far as to look them up to see if they really did exist. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. I don't know. Don't really care. <laughs> At least right now, I don't really care. <laughs> when Jean Vieve turns up at La Voisson's house, it turns out that she can water scry. There's different types of scrying. There's mirror scrying or fire scrying and then, you know, water scrying, where 
those who have the power of reading the future can look into the fire or the water or the mirror and can see the future unfold. And it turns out that Jean Vier has this gift. This really makes La Voisson really happy. So what she does is she decides to, and it's kind of like a um, My Fair Lady situation where La Voisson takes her under wing and builds her up and polishes her up and, you know, helps educate her and train her and make her a little more sophisticated and then she puts her in this old lady's costume and slaps a bunch of makeup on her and sends and basically pimps her out to be a fortune teller to the rich and famous to the courtiers at uh, Louis' court and um, the whole scheme is that Jean Vier would go read palms or water scry or whatever tell the fortunes maybe sell some herbs or poisons or potions or whatever, and then she would take the money and bring it back to La Voisson. And um, in exchange for room and board and La Voisson's protection. So kind of like a brothel for witches. <laughs> a witch a witch brothel for fortune telling and potions. <laughs> I guess. I I don't know. Posing as this 150 year old fortune teller, which nobody is going to believe that. Posing as Madame de Morville, she, you know, tells all these fortunes and gets caught up in dangerous court intrigues. But as a result, because she starts becoming really famous and renowned, and because people are really liking her work. La Boisson is not getting as much work for herself and people begin to not want La Boisson so much but they want Madame de Morville and La Boisson becomes very jealous and um, starts plotting against Madame de Morville aka Genevieve Pasquier. And so meanwhile, while all of this is going on, Jean Vier decides that she wants to break free from La Voisson and, and be more independent and um, make her own money because La Voisson takes the majority of the earnings and she wants to be able to provide for herself. And so she starts kind of skimming off the top, which makes La Voisson really angry, <laughs> um, as it would any pimp. I'm just saying. So, also, while all of this is happening, there's this love affair developing between her and some boy she meets named Durbeck. And so, um, in the end, Jean Vier begins to hear rumors about the king and poisoners that may be surrounding him or um, perhaps attempting something on his life and the police are hunting down these poisoners, and she begins to hear rumors of these witches who are being um, arrested by the police and taken into custody and all of this. And so, without giving any spoilers away, the questions, will she and Durbeck get caught up in the hunt, or will they escape the police in the inevitable torture and execution reserved for witches in 17th century Paris, France? So there's my book review, and uh, I am going to be doing more book reviews. I think the next video that I film is also going to be a book review, um, a nonfiction book about a man named Kana Parker. He was a Comanche warrior in the United States, and it is a really fascinating book. My forte in history tends to be European history, uh, and I admittedly don't know as much. I mean, I, there's like little pockets of knowledge that I have about United States history. Um, and so because I don't know quite as much, I really want to learn more. So that's why I picked up that book to, to read that. And I'm really excited to share. If you liked this video, subscribe, hit the notification bell. If you want to hear more from me, you know the drill. Um, down below, you can see all of my social media. I also host a blog on my web page michellebennington.com and uh, I have I stopped back in May for a little while 
and I will be picking it up again real soon. I'm not sure what my next blog post is going to be about. If you have any suggestions, go ahead and put them in the comments below. I'm happy to take suggestions or recommendations about what my next blog should be about. I do tend to keep my blogs kind of short though, between, you know, three, five, eight minutes, at least under 10 minutes. I don't want this big, long, massive tome to read, you know, you just kind of want to get in and get out. That's what she said. Anyway, I'll be talking to you later. Y'all take care. Bye.